Voyage, a long and extended journey. Voyaging takes faith and commitment to step into the unknown, all the while trusting a known God. A true voyaging spirit knows that the pressure is off because as we choose obedience, it launches us into a lifetime of adventure. With a Voyager spirit, one might feel fear, but chooses to do it afraid with their eyes fixed on what Jesus wants to build. Challenges will come, but we know the reward will always outweigh the risk that we are taking. We will build and we will hand off what is greater than us to the generations that will follow. This is our legacy. This is Voyage Church. Um, as Pastor Rich and Pastor Mindy said, my name is John Teal, and my wife and I will be moving literally in two weeks. God bless. I, it's like happens so fast. Um, from where we live currently in Florida on the East Coast to the Panhandle to launch a brand new church called Voyage Church. And um, I know if I just get up here and tell you that, you're like, oh, that's cool. That's nice. Um, this has been a 10-year dream for us. Um, and the number 10 in Scripture actually means... Um, for a thing to be completed or full. Um, and so for us, it, the, I, I lived in Louisiana. I'm from Florida, born and raised. Lived in Louisiana, did ministry for four years. And my wife and I would drive back and forth past the panhandle and the Lord would just draw us over and over. We would just, we'd have to stop. Um, sometimes we'd stay the night and pray. Once we moved from Louisiana back to Florida, um, friends from Louisiana, we actually have a team of 12 people moving with us to go launch this church. Friends, we would just begin to vacation there in the summertime, and we would just pray. And we really prayed over the entire panhandle, like I, like the whole thing. It's kind of, it's long. I was like, Lord, I don't know where, but somewhere. And um, during the pandemic, uh, my wife and I, we've been doing youth and young adult ministry for the past 10 years. And uh, when the pandemic hit, the church we've been serving at, Bold City Church in Jacksonville, Florida, um, our youth ministry with COVID, obviously we weren't meeting and all of our students were bummed because there was no prom. Prom was canceled. And so we were like, we're gonna do something. So we did this online virtual prom. We had like 13 churches from all over the nation and we gave away like Playstations and Xbox and stuff like that. And then we just basically, they showed up in their houses all dressed up and we just had a live DJ on the internet to YouTube and they were having a party, it was awesome. Well, that next morning, my wife and I woke up and we drove to the Panhandle because a few weeks prior, she had texted me and said, hey, have you ever heard of Pace? We're looking in Pensacola, right? Like, you know, like right there on the water. Destin, like the, the towns that are like right on the beach. She was like, yes, Lord, we're called to the Panhandle. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We're right. And my wife texted me and said, have you ever heard of Pace, Florida? And I said, nope. And so I, I look it up and it's about 12 to 15 minutes north of Pensacola. And I look at it, and I'm like, well, we should just drive out there. So that, that next morning after our, our online prom, our church was still meeting online. So we put the phone up in the car and just drove. It was about a five-hour drive from where we live. And we spent the whole day there. And as we drove away, I just felt my heart begin to grow. It's like, that's the place. That's the place. Over the months to come, we would continue to just pray and study and research and realize that there's, like, crazy growth. This town um, years ago was maybe about 10,000 people. It's sitting somewhere around 38,000 in just that town. There's a town just um, a few minutes from it where it sits about 56,000. And in Santa Rosa County, the county that it's in is the second fastest growing county in the state of Florida. Has the number eight school district in the state of Florida. And these are things we didn't know when our heart began to grow for the area. Um, and God's just done some crazy stuff. And so, like I said, we are moving our family. My wife is in the back holding our four month old Canyon Jones. Summer Kate, oh, there's Summer Kate. She's in the back as well. Um, and so I, I know I'm gonna be up here preaching, but just so you know, there is faith in those little kids and in that woman that, is, that this thing's possible. Um, 
when we, when we told our daughter, Summer, you know, she's five years old, she'll be starting kindergarten, she's got amazing friends, she's been doing VPK, um, our pastor uh, from Jacksonville, his daughter and, and Summer are best friends, and so when we sat her down to tell her, hey baby, we're moving, Jesus is asking us to do something, we recorded the, the moment, but she got excited, and, and we asked her what she thinks, and, and she said she was she was excited about it. We asked her to pray, and she began to pray, and she was like, Jesus, I pray that people that don't know you will know you, and people that don't listen to you will just start listening to you. And I was like, man, I'm just gonna let her preach week one. If you ain't listening to Jesus, just start listening, okay? But um, I wanna preach a message today called The Voyage of Victory. The Voyage for us, it's not just a catchy name. It's honestly not about a brand or anything like that. Um, the Voyage is... Like you saw in the video, it's a long and extended journey, and I have pastored long enough to see people come in, at, in and out of church, and uh, I've seen, heard far too many people say like, oh, I love Jesus, but I'm just kind of done with church. Just so you know, that don't work. So that woman right there is my bride. The church is Jesus' bride. If you said, hey, John, I like you, but I don't like your bride, we ain't hanging. It don't work that way. Jesus loves his bride. It's called the church. And those that plant themselves in the house of the Lord will flourish. So you don't get any flourishing in life. You don't get any clarity in life if you're not connected to the bride of Christ. And so the voyage for us is we've seen a lot of people come in and out. And look, I've been hurt in church. I've had pastors that I've worked for, pastors I submitted to do some terrible things because people are people, right? You've got incredible pastors here. They're not superhuman. They're just supernaturally committed to the call of God on their life. But... I've watched so many people in and out of church, and what I've realized is this thing with Jesus is a voyage. It's the long and extended journey. We're not going to build something fast. I want to build something that lasts. I want something that's got a legacy attached to it. I want something that goes beyond me. I want something that we can hand to our kids and that our kids would be proud of leading. And that's the kind of church I just need you to know. I get the opportunity to go speak some places. What you have right here, what you have right here, this is rare. That kind of worship, like, to truly believe that God inhabits the praises of his people. Like, man, there's something special happening here. And one of the statements for our church is very simply, um, I know, been in church long enough, maybe you've seen people out there and they got like their, you know, reach, teach, send, or whatever their statements are. For us, we just came up with something really simple. We wanna do family really, really well and change the world with some friends. And your pastors are literally like family to Shauna and I. I don't know if y'all know this, but Shauna and Mindy, how many years ago, six, seven, eight, almost nine, Lord God, met in a bathroom at a conference. <laughs> Ladies, you need a best friend? Let's go to the bathroom, okay? <laughs> but they met at a conference, and, and th this relationship just stayed, and, and, and God just really began to connect us, and man, I'm so thankful for you too. So, so thankful. I can't, I can't imagine even taking this step without watching Big Church. I was telling them last night, we were having dinner, Pastor Rich made some wings, and y'all, the glory, like I feel it, okay, these wings. You, if he ever invites you over for wings, you cancel whatever plans you previously had. But we've watched big church from a distance, and I've had the opportunity to, to speak here a couple times, and man, what you guys are doing, I know it's impacting your lives, but just know there's people all over the nation watching this thing, all over the nation. I know you might just look in the room and be like, oh, but man, you know, I'm thinking like tens of thousands, oh, there's tens of thousands watching. They're watching, and so continue to go after the things of God, and I hope this message this morning inspires you to uh, don't quit the voyage. It's the long and extended journey. Long and extended, and it will be worth it. So the title of my message this morning is called The Voyage of Victory. Um, I might get a little excited at times. If so, just go ahead and say, go ahead, white boy, preach. Let them skinny jeans work, whatever you need to say, all right? But I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit to teach us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, teach us in Jesus' name, amen. That's all we need. We just really need him. He's the teacher, right? So um, one of the statements for our church that we kind of thought of was about the voyage is the voyage of becoming. And this word becoming, God just really began to put it in my heart for, for several months as we were praying and preparing. And the word becoming is very interesting because, see, in the things of God, like when you say yes to Jesus, the Bible tells us that all, the, like everything in the past, the old is gone, all things have become new. They've already become new. But God kept giving me this word becoming. And I was like, well, God, I'm not becoming. I've already become new. Like, I am brand new. And he said, in the spirit you are, but in the flesh you got some work. 
There is a becoming, there is a process that we have to go on, and that's what this voyage with Jesus really is. is it's that every single day you're becoming more and more like him. I think a lot of times we think like when we say yes to God or you have a dream of a business or something you want to do in life, it's about a destination. Look, with the voyage with Jesus, it's not about destination. It's just about connection, connecting with God. And honestly, the proof that you are doing what God wants you to do is that 30 years from now, you're more in love with Jesus than you are right now. That's what this thing is about, is that we just continue to become more and more like Jesus. And so I wanna talk to you about a guy, look, in the Bible, you're gonna see things that are gonna happen immediately, right? I love that word, you'll see it throughout the Gospels immediately. Jesus would lay hands on the sick and immediately they got up, right? And that is the supernatural power of God and it does happen. But I think because we live in such a culture that fast pace, I want it right now, right? Like my, my phone is running slow. Bro, you used to have 3G, okay? You got 5GE. <laughs> Just hold on, right? But we, like right now, right now, but I think what we forget is that, yes, there are things that God does instantly, but then there are things that God doesn't do instantly. You wanna know why? I truly believe it's for one reason. He really likes relationship. If my daughter only came to me when she was going through something and then I just fixed the need and she leaves me, I might end up saying, hey, Baby, I might get you that, or we might do that, but let's do this, because I just wanna spend time with her. And so a lot of times, the thing that we're praying, God, why aren't you doing this? He's like, I am, I'm just doing it slower than you wanted me to, because I just really love being with you. There are times that we're begging God to do something immediately, and God's like, but if I did it, you might walk away, and we haven't been this close in a while. And I think there's times where we're waiting. God, I'm waiting on you to do this. God, I wanna see this happen. And God says, I I'm gonna do it. But I wonder if you have ever asked something of God and not gotten it and gotten so frustrated to walk away from the things of God, what if, if you would have paused just long enough to say, I might not have gotten what I asked for, but I'm closer to him than I was before. And that's what we want. That's what this is all about. Because really, I think we can make this life of faith about getting something from him instead of just living for him. That's, that's what this is about. And so I wanna talk about a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not the guy that you see anything in scripture that happened instantaneous. It was not some miraculous thing that happened out the gate. Nicodemus, if you've been in church any amount of time, you probably only remember him from one story in scripture. And it's actually where we get the, the verse that even if you're like lost, lost, like even if you're like going to hell and you're proud of it, you probably know John 3.16 in some way, shape or form, right? You can at least quote it like 85%. But John 3, 16 is not just this verse of, for God so loved the world that he gave it. That, that statement Jesus made is in the midst of a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. And so I wanna walk you through, but we actually see him three times in scripture. Most of the time we only talk about the one. And so I'm gonna read 21 verses just to give you context. I know that's a lot. And a lot of times, um, like in, in preacher world, they'll tell you like, hey, man, don't read that much of the Bible. And I'm like, first off, they need more of the Bible than they need more of what I gotta say. And second of all, <laughs> If someone next to you is gonna, gonna fall asleep, I've been in youth ministry over a decade. You know what I'm gonna tell you to do? You better just chop them in the throat and wake them up, okay? <laughs> 21 verses, stick with me. I'll, I'll read it with some vocal inflection to keep you engaged. There was, a there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, everybody say after dark. After dark. One evening he came to speak with Jesus. Some of y'all doing some stuff after dark you should not be doing, you should be going to talk with Jesus, okay? After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, that's a statement. Would everyone agree? He just made a statement. I love Jesus' Jesus's response. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus, what conversation are you having? <laughs> that guy just showed up and said, we know you're from God. We've seen your miraculous signs. And Jesus says, well, you can't be born again. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And it's like, okay, I was just saying I thought your miracles were cool, bro, right? <laughs> Do you know why Jesus responds this way? It's because Nicodemus is talking about the miraculous signs and the amazing things he's seen, but what he doesn't realize, he just thinks they're, they're just these really cool magic tricks, and Jesus says that's actually the kingdom of God manifesting, but you'll never be able to connect the dots until you're born again. 
You'll never be able to understand the purpose of what those things are until you're born again. That's why Jesus responds that way. But in essence, it's like Jesus is answering a question that Nicodemus really has, but because he's Jesus, and we see this other times in the gospel, he can answer questions that are in your head that you don't even have to say. Can you imagine being in that room? You ever heard about the story where the, the Pharisees are sitting in the room and Jesus heals this little boy that's lowered through the roof and it says they, asked, they thought to themselves and Jesus answered. Man, that'd be a fun room to be in, right? <laughs> Jesus would start popping off answers. Like, I didn't say anything. Yeah, you were thinking that. You, just, you didn't get it out yet. So Jesus says, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Verse four, what do you mean? Question number one by Nicodemus, explain Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? I can imagine Jesus is like um, a a Christian talking to a lost friend. It's like, oh man, we gotta go back to square one. Okay. (laughs) Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Just to help somebody out who's like, I'll believe in this stuff about Jesus when it all makes sense. Jesus said, you, you, you ain't gonna be able to understand it all. But then again, isn't that what faith is all about? And then again, isn't it weird when you meet someone and they're like, I, I just, I'm, I'm not okay with all the faith stuff. Bubba, you drive down a two-lane highway with someone driving in your direction at like 55, 65 miles an hour, and the only thing that separates you and him is painted yellow lines, <laughs> and you ain't never met them. And by faith, you're gonna believe they're gonna do what they should do and stay on their side of the paint. Don't tell me that you don't have faith. You just struggle putting faith in something that makes you surrender control. But that's where freedom is. Because you would only want to put control in the one who ever gave you even the, the, the slight bit of control we do have, the ability to make choices. It came from him anyways. So man, surrendering to him, it, it, it's the only way. And there are things that aren't going to make sense. Verse nine, and here's the kind of response you see from Nicodemus. How are these things possible? Question number two. Nicodemus asked, verse 10, Jesus replied, you're a respected Jewish teacher and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you, notice he says we, because when Jesus is speaking here, he's actually talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We tell you what we know and have seen and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? There are some of us that desire to see like the greater things that God has, and God's like, yeah, but I just need you to show up to church consistently. I just need to see that you're willing to tithe and be faithful to the things of God. Like there are greater things and more things he wants to reveal to us, but there are some things just right now, right now, the the things right in front of us. And he says, but if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how could I, uh, you understand if I tell you about heavenly things? Verse 13, no one has ever gone to heaven in return, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up a bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. I know if you don't understand the bronze pole, it's okay. He's talking to Jewish people. They get it. Verse 15, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For, in verse 16, here it is. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3, 16, smack dab in the middle of a guy showing up to Jesus in the middle of the night asking some questions. And if you didn't know, the reason he's showing up in the middle of the night is because he's a Pharisee. He hangs out with a group that wants to arrest Jesus. He hangs out with a group that that is like, this guy is causing issues, but Nicodemus, something on the inside of his heart is like, I gotta ask some questions. And so he ends up going to Jesus. Now the reason he goes at night is because he doesn't want his boys to know that he's going to ask some questions. And, and, and we could shame somebody like that. You could, make, you could make someone feel, hey, if you're gonna say yes to Jesus, this is how it has to start. Whoa, 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 just because your voyage looked like that doesn't mean that theirs is. It's okay, for, it's okay for them to start somewhere. I'm just glad he's asking questions. You might be in here today and be like, man, I don't know. I'm just questioning some of the things of God. Good thing you're questioning it. I would rather you have questions for him than statements about his non-existence. Like we're making headway, we're going somewhere. 
So Nicodemus goes and asks some questions, and it's okay. And then smack dab in the middle, God, uh, Jesus speaks about God's love for the world, and we get John 3, 16. Verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge, or another word there would be condemn the world. So if you ever meet anybody and they're like, oh, God just wants, you know, he's just here to judge everybody. No, no, God didn't send his son into the world to judge or condemn, but to save the world through him. There's a lot of people who ask a lot of questions, well, if God was so good, why would he do this? You're gonna get wrong answers every time you ask wrong questions. See, God is so good and so loving and so holy, how could he even make a way for a sinner like me? Right question, that's the right question. And at that point, you get responses like, God says, I didn't send my son into the world to judge, I sent him there to save, to rescue. Verse 18, there is no judgment or no condemnation against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged or condemned. So hey, when someone's like, well, Christians just judge me and condemn me. No, actually, just not believing does that to you already. Nobody has to judge or condemn anyone because just not believing already does that. And this is what Jesus said. These aren't my words, so get upset with him if you don't like it. Verse 19, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than they loved light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for the fear that their sins will be exposed. But can I tell you today that if there's a sin you're trying to hide, it being exposed in the light is not to shame you, it's to set you free. It's not shame on you, it's shame off of you so that you can walk in everything that God has. That's the purpose of the light. If you've ever broken a toe in the dark, and you just thought to yourself, I just gotta get to the bathroom real quick, it's 3 a.m., I just gotta go to the bathroom. You know you wish you would've flipped that light switch on after that pinky toe hit the corner of that table. You know, because the light is what, allow, it's, it's not, oh my gosh, look how bad you are, it's oh my gosh, now we can see where the issues exist so that we can walk in freedom. And then verse 21, but those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. One of the first things I'd like to say to you is this. You need to seize the moment so the moment doesn't seize you. Nicodemus, can you imagine, like when I read the Bible, I read it like a Netflix scene. You can't read the Bible and be like, oh, the Bible's just boring. You're boring. Look, the Bible is not boring. There's way, way, way too much goodness in the word of God. And, and I read it like that. And so I just imagine the parts that we don't have. Nicodemus just sitting there after he's seen Jesus do some teachings and, and hung out with the guys who were kind of like casting judgment and trying to figure out how to shut him down. And I just wonder in the middle of the night that night where Nicodemus is like, I just gotta ask him a question. Like, I, I, I can't sit still. Like, I gotta figure something out. I gotta go to this guy. There's something about him. There's something about him. And I love the fact that Nicodemus just seized the moment. Even though he snuck out, even though he didn't want any of his boys to see him, he was like, I'm gonna make a way. I'm gonna seize the moment. Listen to me. When you are on a Sunday morning and you feel the presence of God moving and something's happening and you've been going through something and they've got a prayer team, right? Or after service, you walk past somebody, maybe one of the pastors or a leader or a friend that you know is committed to the things of God and there's that thing on the inside of you that's like, man, I really just need prayer. Like, I just need to let somebody know what's going on. Seize that moment. Don't let that go by. Don't let that go by because I'm telling you, this moment that I just shared with you with Nicodemus, it set him on a voyage that I'm about to show you that's pretty incredible. So I have three points. The first one is this. On the voyage, your questions are valid and valued. I think a lot of times, even in the church, we've made people feel bad for asking questions. I love the fact that Jesus was totally okay with Nicodemus' questions. He could show up and he could ask, man, how is that possible? I mean, Jesus even started giving answers before Nicodemus really started giving questions, right? I think Nicodemus just tried to get in like, hey man, you're pretty awesome. I saw your magic trick, it was, it was really cool, right? And then he just immediately just starts responding. Here's how you get into the kingdom of God, because I know that's what you're actually asking. I know that's what you desire. And here's what I realize. Some of the greatest leaders of tomorrow are the greatest question askers of today. That's what God actually desires, right? He desires, lead. this is not leaders like, oh, you're like, you have to be a boss at your business or you have to like be a preacher. No, no, no. I'm talking about leaders like in your home, leaders in your neighborhood, leaders in your workplace, and you're not the boss, right? And your boss is even doing things that aren't okay, but there's this principle called leading up and you just start making decisions and doing things out of honor, right? By doing the right thing and it just begins to shift and change a culture. The, and the only way you'll ever lead like that is by truly finding yourself in front of Jesus asking questions. Like, God, this is what I'm struggling with. God, this is what I'm processing through. See, honesty matters. Honesty matters. 
So we drove to Kentucky on our anniversary, celebrated nine years, my wife and I, Shauna. Um, and she was like, babe, I want a Waffle House. I want a Waffle House meal. And I was like, go. yes, ma'am, let's do this. <laughs> Glory to God. With two kids, all right, let's go to Waffle House. So we, we stop at a Waffle House outside of Spartanburg, and you know, there's really not anybody in there, and so you know, I, I, I get, um, I get the, the hamburger on the Texas toast, and I get my hash browns covered and chunked because there's no other way to do it, right? And we, we get all our food, and it was honestly super fast. And Shauna tells Summer, our daughter, she had never been to a Waffle House. I know five years of we deprived a child. I can't believe it. But Shauna's like, baby, this is like hibachi. It's like hash brown hibachi. Look back there. They got the little skillet, you know? And so um, we, we're sitting there at Waffle House, and we're just having a good old anniversary dinner. Nine years, let's go. Shauna goes over to the jukebox. She puts a dollar in. She picks like three, four songs. Music's playing. And then this guy comes through the door, and the jukebox is like right here. If this is a jukebox, and he gets down, and the window's right here. And he's like, he's trying to get me. He's trying to get me. And I was like, what's happening? What is going on? And he's like, this is what happens when you go to Waffle House, right? Uh, that guy out there, he's, he's, he's trying to hurt me. He threw the screwdriver at me. <laughs> and so there's this whole situation going down. Shauna and, and Summer are still kind of eating their food, and I'm kind of catching what's going on. And then Shauna's like, what's happening? And I was like, I think there's somebody mad at this guy. And then the, 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 the waitress, the, the lady uh, that was serving our table, she's like, sir, what does he look like? Okay, I'll call the cops. So she's on the phone with the police. This guy's hiding behind the jukebox. She's like, sir, look, come around here, come around here. Sets him in a table behind our family. So I'm like, great. I, I don't know what's about to happen. Like, if someone comes on the window and starts shooting, like, we're in the line of fire, Right, like, what is going on? Then Shauna's like, "Ma'am, can we lock the doors so whoever's trying to get this guy?" Like, no, I can't lock the doors. You guys are in here eating. If you wanted to leave, that'd be against the law. I'm like, "Man, someone could could come in here with a gun. We can lock the door, right?" And and then of course she kind of just she's like, "Oh, he ain't coming in here. Not with not with kids in here." Oh, I was like, "Okay, good. She's gonna fight. I don't even gotta fight, right?" Because <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. I don't know what I'm gonna. I'm just one of those people who's like, I might be skinny, but I'm crazy, you know, and just kind of freak people out. And my eyes roll in the back of my head, and then they just back up or something. So this whole situation's going down. Poor guy who's hiding, he keeps looking at Sean. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry I got your kids into this mess. So this whole thing goes down. We end up seeing the guy, and he is angry, y'all. The guy that's coming after him, he's like in the parking lot, gas station next door. I mean, he's cussing, and he's kicking, and he's looking. It's like, I think he knows he's in Waffle House, but he's kind of like, not, doesn't want to just barge in. But it's like, he's just angry from 100 yards away. And so we're watching this thing, and he disappear and come back. And I keep thinking, man, he's going to come around and just start like bullet holes through the windows. And so I, I'm just praying and, and watching. And then the police finally show up. When they show up, the guy who was hiding goes out there, talks to them, come to find out. And, and, and I don't want the guy to get beat up. Come to find out, he stole, homeboy, uh, stole money from homeboy twice. And so I'm like, man, now look, you come in here hiding and put my family in danger, and you should have just been honest. You should have just been honest and said, hey, man, I, this guy trying to hurt me, I, I stole something. You know, that's why he's mad. That, it makes sense. And I know that, 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 that story might be like, why are you saying that, Pastor John? See, when it comes to the question of your, or when it comes to the statement, your questions are valued and valid. See, honesty really matters. Honesty really, really matters. Here's what I know about honesty. There's a lot of people who desire legacy. That's kind of the whole reason we're going to do this thing. Man, I, I want legacy. And I'm not talking about legacy, having to be like the most famous person, just like a healthy family line. There's some of you, you're the first one in your family to be bought into the things of God. Or you're the first one to go to college. You're the first one to pursue your dreams, right? And you're like, I want this to continue on. I want this to be the new legacy. There is no legacy without honesty. And there's a lot of people who want legacy, but they don't want to be honest. And when it comes to the things of Jesus, I believe, just like Nicodemus, your questions are okay. Some of you in here, you're struggling. There's a, there's a, there's a moment where Jesus, uh, this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, can you please pray? Uh, my, your disciples couldn't cast the, the demon out of my son. And Jesus says, do you believe? He said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. He was honest enough with Jesus to say, I do, but I kind of don't. Like I'm struggling, and I, I just wanna say this today. Look, you've got incredible pastors and there's incredible leaders here, but I've watched far too often in church where everybody's gotta run to go get counsel from somebody, and we're involved in church, and you know who we forget to go to? Go to Jesus. Like for real, when was the last time you set up some space in your house and you told the kids, hey, you watch cartoons, I'm coming, I'm gonna be meeting with God. If you walk in this room, the glory of God is going to blind you. I'm having a moment with Jesus in here. 
But when was the last time you set up a space just to say, God, I'm just bringing some questions before you. God, I'm bringing some stuff that I'm struggling with. Like, when was the last time you really asked him and then waited long enough to listen? Your questions are valid and valued, but you have to be honest. See, the legacy of our voyage with Jesus is found in our honesty before God, but also before others. Do you, do you wanna know why, according to scripture, we do not see, I mean, think about it, guys. I've spent the last 12 years preaching. My heart is that people would get born again, that people would give their lives to Jesus. According to scripture, Nicodemus didn't get born again. And Jesus is the one who preached the message. According to scripture, he slips away and we find him in John chapter seven, which I'm gonna read you in a moment, and he's still hanging out with the Pharisees, still living in that lifestyle. So first off, if you ever feel called to ministry, if you're in here, you're ever just sharing, uh, sharing Jesus with a friend and they don't say yes, or you invite a friend to church and they don't say yes, it's okay. One of Jesus' first times preaching being born again, the guy didn't say yes. And in that moment, in that moment, I believe that the only, one of the major reasons that Nicodemus didn't experience a big movement of freedom is that he was honest before Jesus, but he was still in secrecy before others. Man, you can love Jesus, but Jesus even made the statement, hey, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before my father. Like, it really, really matters that people know, like people know that you and I follow Jesus. I would go to lunch rooms as a, as a youth pastor, be hanging out with a student, and my favorite thing to get teenagers to invite their friends is I'm not gonna do it for them, right? So I'm like, hey man, did, did Jimmy invite you to church? Right, and then Jimmy's like, oh, yeah man, you should come on Wednesday night, like we got a youth group, you know? And you just get to see the awkward dialogue of teenagers just inviting somebody to do something. And I'm like, bro, just if he wants to show up, he can show up, if he doesn't, he doesn't. You either want Jesus and free pizza or you don't, I don't know. The most heartbreaking moments were just like, hey, Jimmy, invite you to church? <laughs> you go to church? And those moments were like, oh, do you want to have a discipleship meeting here or do you want to do that like out in the courtyard? <laughs> because your friend don't know that you follow Jesus and you've been in youth group for the past three years. And that's not, I'm angry with you. That's, there's some freedom you're not experiencing because people don't know. Yeah. Honesty before Jesus and before others. Okay, the second time we see Nicodemus, are you ready? John chapter seven, he shows back up in the Bible. John chapter seven, starting in verse 45. When the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? Because they really wanted Jesus arrested, okay? Verse 46, we have never heard anyone speak like this, the guards responded. In other words, they're like, Jesus is just amazing. I just kind of sit there speechless. I know we were supposed to arrest him, but his words are like really good. Verse 47, have you been led astray too, the Pharisees mocked? Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believe in him? There's a question. This foolish crowd follows him, but they're ignorant of God's law. God's curse is on them. Verse 50, someone who knows God's law. Then Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he's been given a hearing, he asked. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. Now, before I give you point number two, I need to let you in on a secret that I've been taking you on that you haven't seen yet. But Jesus said you must be born again. Now, obviously, when I read that, something heightens in me because we have a four-month-old, so I just watched my wife go through pregnancy for a second time. And I don't know a lot, and she reads articles, and then I find out like, oh my goodness, this means something, this means something. Like when I go to the hospital, I just show up and I'm just like, I don't know, we just put on the scrubs? Okay, scrubs. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what to do, like just tell me where to go, you know what I mean? Um, and then it, it, it was a scheduled C-section this time because of some complications with Summer, and then Shauna's just laying there, she can't feel nothing, she's behind the curtain and she's like, I, I had the GoPro, like I was like filming, you know, waiting for the baby cry, and Shauna's like, put the camera over the thing, see my insides, I, oh no, I don't wanna do that. And she's like, she's like, this is like a once in a lifetime chance, you know? And so it was like one of those things where I was like, ah, like stretch real quick. It didn't work. You couldn't see anything. So, whew, thank goodness. But 
Uh, we just recently went through all this, and here's what I, I a little bit that I know, okay? I, I know I'm a male, and I've never carried a child, um, but there's three trimesters. If I'm incorrect, don't correct me. Um, <laughs> there's three trimesters, and here's what I know about the first trimester, is a, a woman can be in her first trimester of pregnancy, and you not even know it. Usually, what that means is in the darkness of the womb, something is happening, but no one's aware of it. And I just read you trimester one with Nicodemus. At night, he went, and there was something that happened in that space. I would say it was just the very beginning of the pregnancy of being born again. Now, I want you to show you trimester two that we, that we just saw, because in trimester two, that's usually when a woman begins to show. And I want you to notice that in this moment where the Pharisees are like, why didn't you arrest him? Man, are, are, you, are you now led astray by this Jesus too? Is there anybody here who actually believes in him? And then Nicodemus starts to show, and he says, hey, doesn't he deserve a fair trial? And so now we're in trimester two, like there's something happening. He's still a Pharisee. He hasn't said yes to Jesus. He's not living or following the way. He's not one of the disciples at this moment, but there is a voyage that has begun and it's okay. And Jesus knows it. He sees it. He knows what's happening. The second thing uh, on the voyage is this, stand up for what's right. I love that Nicodemus, even in the moment of just like, he's like, I know there's something about him, but I haven't made my decision. But in that moment, he was like, doesn't this guy deserve a fair trial? Like, aren't you guys doing some shady stuff right now? Like, I know, like, you're the religious leaders and you're in cahoots with the government and stuff, but this, this isn't right. And, and I really, really sense that what God wants to do in your life in this next season is gonna have so much to do with just doing things God's way. There is a right way, there is a wrong way. God is a God of righteousness, and it is not God trying to keep something from you. He's actually keeping you for something. I was talking with our daughter the other day, and she wants a dog so bad. Pray, okay? Pray for us. And we're, we're, we'll be getting in our, in our new home in the next few weeks. And, and, and I had, we were just talking about something, and I said, Summer Kate, you can't do that. And she was like, I don't like that you told me that. And I was like, oh, okay. Step, let's go. Um, <laughs> and I was like, baby, the reason I told you that is because I care about you. And that would be dangerous if you were to do that. And I was trying to process, how can I get her to, and I said, you want a dog, don't you? And she was like, yes, sir. And I said, now, you know our new house doesn't have a fence in the backyard. We're gonna have to get a fence built. We're gonna have to hire somebody because your boy's not building a fence, okay? Um, we're gonna have to get a fence. And I said, now, we don't have to. If you wanna get a dog and we have no fence, we can just let the dog freely run wherever the dog wants. Now, the dog could get in the street and get hit. So would you rather have a fence or no fence? She was like, have a fence. I said, why? That's so mean to give the, your dog boundaries like that. And she was like, no, I don't want him to get hurt. I said, so you're telling me you give the dog boundaries because you love the dog? So many people, well, Christianity is I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do that. No, 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 it's I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to. My father's giving me boundaries because he loves me. There's things that I don't gotta get into that will give me regret and shame and guilt. I don't have to. I get to live in his presence and be free. I get to, I get to. There is a right way. God has a way. And look, God's way is going to be uncomfortable for your flesh. But this isn't about being free in the flesh. This is about being free in the spirit. Because look, your flesh will fade. All right? Look, some of y'all in here, let's go back 20 years and we can see you just tore up from the floor up. Like you just like ripped. And now, like things have changed a little bit. It's okay. We love you. Things have just changed. Gravity happens, right? But do you know what can keep growing and getting stronger? Your spirit. It's why this generation is so much with, with phones. We're like, my looks, my looks, my looks. Baby, I don't care all that you do. Something's going to start. It's just going to happen. But your spirit can continue to grow and to grow and to grow. And so stand up for what's right. I'm at a gas station the other day. We were taking the finance lady out from the church we've been serving at. She's been teaching us a lot because we ain't got a clue what we're doing. We're just going to lots of church. We lost. Um, <laughs> She's been teaching us, so we picked her up from her house, take her out to dinner, we stopped to get gas. And I'm pump, pumping gas, and on top of the gas pump was an iPhone 12. And I was like, man, someone left their phone here. 
I know if that was me, that'd be terrible. So gas was pumping, Sean was in the car, I just walked inside. There was like a line of four or five people, I ain't waiting in the line, it's just turning this in. Hey man, if someone left their phone on, on the gas pump, so put it right here, they'll probably come back for it. I go back out, I'm pumping gas, this guy pulls up, like kind of catty corner right behind me, and he flings his door open, he runs to the back, throws the hatch open, and he's rummaging through his car, and I'm just kind of pumping gas, and you can tell he's like frantic, and I'm kind of connecting dots. I'm like, hey man, you looking for something? And I'm talking the most defeated look. He's just like, man, I did something on my phone. I thought I left it right here. I was just looking for it. Someone probably took it. I was like, dude, I literally just took iPhone 12, like, inside. And this guy looked at me and was like, like, almost to the point of tears. Hands on his knees. He's like, are you serious, man? He's like, thank you so much. He's like, man, someone, someone would have, I know so many people would have just stole that and sold it. And I was just kind of like, dude, it's inside. Go get your phone, right? I got a phone. Like, I don't need your phone. And I keep pumping gas, and then another guy across from me, he says, man, I can't believe you did that. I believe in karma. Good stuff's coming to you, man. And I'm just sitting in the gas station. I want to go, does nobody do the right thing? Like, first off, it's an iPhone, which means it's got really good security. I'm going to have to figure out how to hack it and clear it. And if I want to sell it, i got to take the case off of it so it don't look like I stole it. And then if I want to use it, just go get a job. That's way too much work. I ain't got time for that. Like, just do the right thing. And if I got any parents in the house, as Frozen would say, just do the next right thing. Look, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the voyage with Jesus, do the right thing. And I'm not telling you you're going to get it right all the time. But I love that Jesus very clearly say, hey, blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. When you get it wrong, confess you got it wrong. And then get back up to get it right. That's God's desire. And then we move into the third trimester. So number one was your questions are valid and valued. Number two, stand up for what's right. And then we move into the third trimester. Now, in the third trimester of a woman who is pregnant, they would say in the third trimester, the baby is fully formed, right? The body of the baby fully formed there, um, really, really close to the, the weight and size and length that the baby will be, right? There will be some changes in that third trimester, obviously, when it comes to weight. But like at that point, we know that baby fully formed, come out in the third trimester and do well, right? I want you to see the third and final time we see Nicodemus in Scripture, and I'm telling you, this is so overlooked that I actually didn't know he was in Scripture here until several years ago when I, I stumbled upon this. And I actually had to go back and make sure that I was biblically correct that, like, is this the same Nicodemus? John 19, starting in verse 38, we're in the third trimester, the trimester I would call carry the body. Verse 38, afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, Please know we know about the 12 disciples, but there were a whole lot of people who weren't walking in the freedom that the 12 disciples, even though we, we nitpick, oh, he was a doubter and he sank, but at least they were out there doing it. You had people trying to be disciples of Jesus secretly, and that's not where freedom's found. But this guy, finally getting out of the secrecy, it says, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, right? He allowed the uh, fear of man to stop him from being open and honest about what he believed about Jesus. He asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. Verse 39, with him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. We're in the third trimester of Nicodemus' voyage, and I want you to see what happens. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made of myrrh and aloe. Following Jewish bur um, burial customs, they wrapped the body uh, Jesus' body with the spices and long sheets of linen cloth. And in the place of the crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Number three is spend it all on the king. Because there's a couple things that happened here. Nicodemus went to Jesus in secrecy. But now... He's going to take care of the body of Jesus openly. And when I mean openly, Jewish custom was to carry five pounds of spices to anoint a body for burial. Just to let you know, five pounds, Nicodemus could hide in his cloak. He could make his way, kind of get there, slip it to Joseph. Here, man. Give it to him. Out. Bible says 75 pounds. 
Biblical history would tell us 75 pounds was only reserved for one kind of person, royalty. I know there was that moment at night that Nicodemus went to Jesus, and according to what we know, he didn't say, yes, Jesus, I accept you. Like, you're the Messiah. I'll follow you. No, he just got some questions answered, and he slipped away. And then he kind of even said, man, some, someone's got to do what's right for this guy. And he stands up, and he says something, but he still slips back into that group that he was with, not fully breaking away from those patterns and those ways. But all I know is the third time we see Nicodemus on his voyage of following Jesus, he takes 75 pounds and when people are looking at him they're going he's going to anoint a king and at that point Nicodemus is like he is a king I believe it and I'm I can't be secret about it I'm open about it I'm following the one 75 pounds he anoints his king and he's not quiet about it. And you know what, what Christian history would go on to tell us? That Nicodemus was one of the most influential people in starting and planting churches all throughout the first church. But he had a voyage. It maybe didn't look like mine or look like yours. And guess what? Jesus has a voyage for you too. Some of you have been on the voyage with Jesus and you are on the brink of just wanting to just kind of step away and be like, I'm burnt out, I'm overwhelmed. Stay the voyage. Don't you quit. When he carried that cross to Calvary, every step with your name on his mind, every nail driven, every whiplash, you, because he wanted to give you the opportunity to experience the life you were created to experience. And without him, there is no voyage. It's a lot of people aimlessly meandering, trying to find their way, dissatisfied. You stand to your feet. So I'd just like to tell someone today, especially if you grew up in church, being saved or being born again, it's not just a moment. It can be a process. And that's okay. And a church like this is the kind of church you wanna be a part of to go through that process, to ask questions, to learn what's right and what's God's way. We had a situation with Summer Kate not long ago at school where something happened that was not okay to her. A little girl had, had there were just some, some things said and done and you know, then she starts talking and I'm like, whoa, 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 that ain't right. How does she know about that? And we had to sit down and have a conversation and say, baby, God has a way and this is God's way. And, and she didn't do anything wrong. She didn't know. She needed to learn. When you are a part of a healthy church community, you can continue to learn God's way. And then just at the very end, like I said, number three, spend it all on the king. Man, your life, spend it on the king. And what I mean by that is like, are you an insurance adjuster? Okay, spend it all on the king. Like literally use your life that people can look at you, because here's the best part of the whole story. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. See, when I, when I study scripture, I gotta dig deep. And Nicodemus is not just Nicodemus. His name in Greek, the language of the New Testament, his name means victory for the people. So Nicodemus continuing to ask questions, learning to do what's right, getting to the point where Jesus, I'll spend it all on you. It's not just for you, it's for the other people. There's people watching you step into victory, stay the voyage. There's some people that have watched my wife and I's lives and early on in ministry, oh, that's cute, that's nice. 10 years later, still laying our lives down. We've been hurt, we've gone through stuff, but we are staying the voyage. My eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm not quitting, I'm not walking away. Because he has way too high of a calling on my life and your life. But you know what? He's got way too high of a calling on your sister's life and your brother's life and your mom's life. And your yes is victory for the people. For the people. So this morning, I got two questions. Can we have the prayer team? Can I have prayer team? Can we do that? If prayer team can come up, if you in this room have not said yes to the voyage of following Jesus, the band's gonna lead us. And as they begin to lead us, I want you to walk up to one of these people and say, I wanna start the voyage. I wanna start the voyage of following Jesus. But then there's another group of people and I feel this strongly in my spirit. 
There's some of you, it's just been easy just to get comfortable or lazy, or you're even in that place of contemplating like, hey, maybe I'm just gonna take a few steps back. If that's you, I want you to go and pray with someone this morning and say, no, 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 I'm staying the voyage. Like it's a long and extended journey. For the rest of my life, all of my days, I'm fixed on Jesus. Because Jesus said, John 16, 33, in this life you will have trouble. And then he even said, hey, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will have trouble and there will be burdens, but trouble and burdens are just better with Jesus. You're going to have them with him or without him. I'd rather have them with him. That's what happens when you're planted in the house of God, when you're a part of a healthy community. So this morning, man, I, I, I really, really encourage you. There is nothing like the voyage of becoming more and more like Jesus. Can I pray for you? Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word. God, I pray you seal it in our hearts. God, if there's someone in here with questions, God, they're valid, they're valued, it's okay. God, if there's someone in here who's just asking questions, God, that you would just begin to reveal to them your way. God, you have a way of living our life and to be able to live it well brings you glory, but God also gives us peace. And God, if there's anybody in here who's been holding anything back in worship, God, in, in, with their job, God, the way that they live openly in front of people. God, may this morning be the morning we say, no, for the rest of my life, I spend it all on the King. He's the one. Jesus, we thank you. And you never leave us and you never forsake us. Our eyes fixed on you with the voyage of becoming.